My very special guest today on The Village Voice is Philip Tripp, all the way from Guatemala. Good morning, good evening it is for you, Philip. How are you? It is very well. How are you, Peter? Good to be here. Yeah, great to have you on the show as well. And uh, uh, you have quite a background in community, so that uh, makes you really relevant to the to the object of this program or this uh, podcast is is essentially to bring together a whole group of us who are working on what I essentially call villages. Uh, that is uh, communities of people who have each other's backs. And I gather that's where you're living right now, in the midst of that. Yeah, that's right. So I am the manager here at the community that I'm living in, which is called Karuna. Uh, we are an artist's residency. Uh, that's what we call ourselves, but we do monthly silent retreats and different meditation classes and things. Uh, we also do a weekly kirtan, which I've just come from, which is like a regular kind of um, stalwart kind of event here on Lake Atitlan where uh, people love to come to connect and experience community and share mantras. Um, and the stuff that doesn't really get that much play as well about the community is we also are about 50% food sufficient. So we grow a lot of our own food here and then supplement it with some things from the, the local market here in the village. So yes, I've been deep dive on a lot of different ways at approaching creating community both here in guatemala and also back home in australia going back to uh, back home in australia you uh, uh, established a community here and i think assisted uh, several other communities including the grounded community uh, rupert and his team yeah so i think what has given me the touch point with getting involved in that is my background is that i'm a lawyer uh, so the skill set that I have to bring to the table uh, is that legal skill set in terms of navigating uh, legal structures and also sorting sorting out kind of the fact and fiction that's out there about the best way to approach that. So uh, that was the role that I played in setting up the community that I'm a part of uh, near Mount Tambourine in Kanangra. And then I've also done that for a bunch of clients, including Rupert, um, which kind of all, all began uh, in the middle of the pandemic when, when I started running uh, seminars called Building Community Fundamentals. Um, and it's been an interesting process since then as I iterated on that seminar and started inviting different guests like Cass Smith, who's an accountant, um, uh, Shane Silvenspring, who's a well-known planner in the area that's deeply involved in a lot of the community work also, yep. uh, Robert and others. Um, and it's kind of become this uh, momentum that kind of built up that led to a number of major projects getting started or me taking on pieces of work to assist those projects. So, Before we go um, into, yeah. you know, your current residence uh, and, and the current space that you find yourself in, I wonder if you could, uh, uh, in a, a short response, give a, a what you see to be the fundamentals of uh, an operating community, a working community. I think that's a really great question, and it it obviously, I mean, the, the classic kind of economical economic uh, expert answer, it depends, has to kind of come up at the start, or my my legal brain starts to make disclaimers. <laughs> of course, before I answer open ended um, thing like that, but I think that fundamentally, one of the things that's uh, super important in the in the there's kind of two two things which has been interesting for me and for my mind in eng engaging and grappling with this. My work in Australia has been all about starting from zero and identifying a site, buying a site, building a structure, getting your group together, um, getting on the same page in terms of vision and values, which is incredibly important. Yep. at the in the setup phase but then your question i think is more more angled towards what makes a community successful and actually all of that setup work probably forms dot point one you know all of that condenses into dot point one of how to do a successful community because all of that essentially gets you through the gate it's your football shoes right. to get you on the field to start playing then the question is well how do we actually play well um you know and so oh yeah that is where, yeah, yeah. And so I think one of the things that comes out of the research out of Denmark, where 
they the, with the co-housing kind of movement one of the fundamentals that they that they say makes communities work well is breaking bread together you know one of the cornerstones is sharing a regular meal you know like doing those personal things together um share pr preparing food sitting down and having that as a regular kind of backbone of what the community does so important i think some kind of ethos that grounds the community something that brings everybody together around some sort of sense of sacrament some sense of ritual i think me experiencing here in karuna karuna is the ancient buddhist word for compassion essentially and this community here has uh, a bedrock of like Buddhist practice, con contemplative practice, and devotional right. practice as well with the kirtans, as being something that grounds what the project is doing and aspiring to achieve in something greater than the individuals yes. and even the group. It's 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 extending beyond the reach of just the you know that that expression that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. You know, like that the community wants to be more than just 20 people living on land together. Because right. that that's dot point. The rest is what is this community community aspiring to achieve? And I think where communities can hit the iceberg is where one th there is th that isn't clear what what the community is actually seeking to achieve over the 10 20 year time horizon like what it's trying to actually achieve in the world what it's trying to contribute right. either not clear or it's clear to some and it's different and differently clear to others and so you've kind of got this you know kind of like passing ships in the night scenario going where some people are thinking this is going to be a nudist colony Others are thinking it's going to be a place for festivals. Another is thinking it's going to be, we're going to shut the gate and lock the world out and never interact with anyone. You, you know, it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like competing objectives that don't align. Um, so I would say uh, having, having that as kind of a foundation uh, is super important for the longevity and success of a community is like a clear idea of what it's aspiring to achieve. And that and that that goal needs to be something that almost transcends transcends the community itself. Uh, an yeah. idea of being service, being of service to the greater community in one form or another. Um, I think the good communities are always seeking to achieve that. A good friend of mine, Jason, uh, uh, did his PhD on just this subject, and the the key and principal thing was precisely that that those with the success on their hands, that is, who had some longevity, had uh, without without uh, exception, had some guiding principle that they were all bound to, you know, that they were uh, and, and willingly bound to. So the, they were moving ahead as a single unit. Uh, the community was a single unit rather than individuals having their own ideas about what this might be or what it could be and so on. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think then having... Having the structures that really embed that in a tangible way, um, and so in the community that I'm in now, it looks like specific offerings that are created and experienced, and also shared with the shared with guests that come in and experience those things. Whether it's like Rupert's crew in Grounded running festivals and permaculture trainings, or whether it's us over here doing monthly silent retreats and weekly kirtans. Because the trap also can be having great verbiage. Like I've worked with some clients of mine where great verbiage, excellently well-drafted, colorful 60-page PDF documents that articulate a lot of high aspirations. The dream. Stuff. <laughs> yeah. But, but when does it embody? When does it become experiential? When do we get together and sit down and do something? Uh, that reflects those values. That's that's then an incredibly important piece, because then the mind can start to rest. Because it's not all just out in the ethers. It's it starts to become. Th this is what our community stands for, and this is what we do. Yeah, the um, the the whole idea of uh, of the PDF, if you like, of the the big description of exactly how it is that we want to live together is a beautiful mind exercise for sure. 
But if that's not embodied, if there are no practices within the community that actually bring folk together, and as you say, uh, 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 breaking bread together, so dining together, uh, working on projects, and uh, and I guess a spiritual side almost to uh, to to the direction that is being taken. And by that, I don't mean religious, but rather spiritual. You know, something that says there is a a soul developed within this thing we call our community. Yeah, and this comes to this idea that I have as well, which is like idealism and, and big grand ideas about what the world needs and how to make the world a better place need to start at home. And so first of all, it's about practicing things like nonviolent communication, things like really hearing each other, things like consciously moving into empathy rather than self defending oneself or one's point of view. Like the community, as I experience it here, is really a little, um, it, it's so fascinating to me. You know, it's so fascinating. Uh, it's like a little, um, it's a, like a little hub within which we all get to work on ourselves and try to kind of go beyond the ego, go beyond our limited ideas and try to really show up for the cohesiveness of what we're trying to do. And when that really starts to land, when, when you, when you as a community can work through conflict, and conflict resolve in a good way. And that's where it's it's steering away from that violent communication, that finger pointing and yes. going through things, being authentic about things that are hard and, and going through that, navigating that territory and finding that you come throughout the other side of that, still able to work together and support each other um, and even experience, dare I say it, you know, uh, an ex uh, something akin to like love and peace and the way that some of us might imagine a good family life might have been and maybe we didn't all experience that necessarily growing up depending on your childhood and how that experience was but a lot of what i experience here in in community uh that growth mindset and 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 a lot of healing yeah. as well is possible with knowing that these relationships this network of relationships that i exist within are there for the long term and that there's space for us to take risks. There's space for us to risk our truth and space for us to be seen and also empathized with, and then conflict resolve and circle around topics that need to be circled around. What that, what that then does if it's functioning well is that then becomes a little Island of sanity. You might call a little Island of coherence that within its little bubble functions on its own terms but then naturally it, it it becomes transcendent because rather than being someone that that has a traumatic dysfunctional family but then is out there pontificating about what the UN should do or what the government right. should do or how the political system needs to be reformed the the, the truth of a, a sane group of people that are working together well it is embodied and it speaks for itself and then it naturally starts to transcend it yes. people that people that interact with that start to have a felt experience of something and when you're around people that that have that in their bodies and have that in their experience and have that in their knowing it then it then starts to be like this accordion it starts to breathe in and breathe out it starts to expand and it, and people start to gravitate towards it and then it has this it starts to take on this transcendent quality. Yeah, and uh, when when I witness you uh, working in Guatemala, um, uh, it, it brings to question to me the difference between, say, working in uh, an Australian environment and in Guatemala. Um, first of all, are the people that you're working with mostly the native people, you know, the people who live in the country, or are you working with others who are from elsewhere? It's both. So the people that are permanent residents of the community are, without exception, all of us are uh, expats. Uh, a lot of us, a lot of Americans here in this part of the world, Guatemala being so close to the United States. It's founded yeah. by Luke, Luke uh, Armstrong, who's an author and uh, community creator and singer, uh, who's originally from the United States. Uh, but then the it the, the thing that's fascinating about being here is we employ local workers we local workers have built the structures and they they work with us to enable what we do um but more importantly in my experience is 
actually, we are learning from them. We're learning from the Mayans here. Um, and there's things that I could explain about um, Guatemala, why I believe Guatemala is uniquely placed to do that. Um, in a nutshell, uh, this this community exists within a Mayan village here. Uh, Sunana is a Kechikel uh, people uh, Mayan village on Lake Catitlan, so we're we're in a rural part of Guatemala. Guatemala is unique in the world in the sense that it's a country that has about 45, 40, 45 percent indigenous Mayan make up the population. And that when you ask about the contrast with Australia, I mean, that is really worth pausing and just right. considering. Because, you know, you look at Australia, what would be the percentage of indigenous Australian? Um, it must be close to one percent, if that. One and a half to Probably something like that. One and, yeah. a half, one and a half to two percent. So... Here in Guatemala, there was a major sea change politically recently where the Mayan government, the indigenous Mayan government, won the election in a in, in a very hotly contested and complicated uh, election with lots of protests and shutting of roads and things, uh, which was quite a tense time for the country and for us mm -hmm. as a community. But uh, the son of the deposed leader from the Civil War time in the 1980s in Guatemala, his son... Um, who is who has the support of the Mayan people, the indigenous people, uh, won the election. Um, despite all the corruption that exists in the country, he won the election. And so a Mayan indigenous backed government now forms government in in this country. So that I, I say all of that to contrast a little bit of with Australia and just to point to, I think one of the success factors for this community and also what has made it so interesting to me to learn about community, and to weave in then the topic of, of your podcast, The Village, um, is I'm experiencing this community within the broader context of the Mayan village, the indigenous yes. village that yes. I'm living in also. I'm getting to witness, I'm getting to get to know the locals and the way they think, the way they are oriented to things like money, family, uh, uh, agriculture, how to just do family life, how to do the village. And I feel that they carry that innately in them. It's not something they need to learn. Whereas right. us Westerners, we really, it's something that we need to learn. It's a skill set that doesn't come native to us. It's something that um, I believe is the great challenge of our times. Um, and I, as I hear you speaking, your, your passions uh, to do with the village and the voice of the village um, is your passion as well. Yes, um, yes. And that. That's one of the themes that you get to explore uniquely in this part of the world. Look, it's um, it's something uh, that in setting up or founding the village and the movement of of the village, and then Village Matrix Incorporated, uh, the the principal or key matter for me was that I witnessed so many communities in uh, in like the Western world that would collapse. Largely, I believe, because we have been taught to be so individual. We've been shoved in uh, boxes, essentially separate from one another, and largely have forgotten how to be in a community of people and how to essentially uh, stay in the room. So uh, the, the, the original concept of bringing people together with regular gatherings of the village was to begin to re-establish that, begin to understand that there is darkness and light in all of us. And if we spend time with one another, we will see all of those different shades from bright brightness to great darkness and everything in between. And how can we find ways to stay in the room with one another? The, the, mm. the funniest thing I think that occurred was we were all discussing, you know, this adventure we called the village one time, and there was a Kenyan man who had just come from Kenya, and he laughed at us and said, this is no great adventure. This is how I live all the time. Um, and mm. then uh, spoke to us a little about that. I imagine that there's uh, uh, still quite that kind of uh, village community held environment in uh, the Guatemalan situation that you're in. And it's therefore not something that needs to be re-educated. In fact, the opportunity is to be educated, yeah? We're learning from them, absolutely, yeah. hands down. Like they, they are our teachers, uh, and then they're not trying to be teachers. <laughs> they're right. they're living they're living life as they as they live it. And you know, Peter, it's so interesting 
the topic of money, if we just zoom in on money for a moment, because this has been my biggest window into seeing the great disparity between us and the, to how we think and how, how they think. Yes. Um, for them, money is, an, is not an object. Money is, they have not, this is, I'm living in a place where money has not been objectified. For them, right. money is a spirit. Money is a spirit. And if money comes to you, you've been blessed by the spirit of money. And what you do is you use it immediately to support your family, to support your loved ones, to give to support to the people in the village that need it. If there's ever a surplus of money that comes to a household, it's used for that ho household's need straight away. And then it goes to repairing an old person's roof who's unwell and has holes in holes in their roof, or it goes to medicine for a young child that's sick. You know, there's it, money is flows like a river. And these, these people do not, they, they, they just, there's no when hoarding. it comes to them, it immediately, the, the hoarding, the hoarding idea, the, this idea of having a personal bank account and investing for your future and trying to create intergenerational wealth, their, inter, their idea of intergenerational wealth is about reciprocity and knowing that they have their neighbor's back and their neighbor will have their back and that on their piece of the mountainside, they grow coffee and their neighbor grows oranges. And if they give coffee today, when the coffee is harvested in three weeks from now, they'll get some oranges. There's this trust and reciprocity and there's this flow that because money hasn't been objectified, yeah. it flows like everything else flows. It moves like everything else moves in this valley. And that is a, that is like, um, it has kind of blown my mind to start to yeah. understand that. And when I... When I work with my clients and project, you know, kind of back home in Australia, I think it's really good what you say. It's like, I, I love what you've done with the village. I came to a couple of the villages um, in 2021, just before I left Australia. Yes. Um, at that time. And I loved the approach of experiential, getting together and being on land and actually experiencing this thing called being in village and doing right. and doing that for three days, five days, seven days, and you know, repeating in that, deepening those relationships of reciprocity, recognizing that it needs to start there because you can't play leapfrog in this game. No. And that, and in advising clients, that's what I've tried to tell them. It's like you can you can raise three million dollars and buy the perfect property with the water source and the everything, but if you all come together with the mindset, what's in it for me, which we have to admit our brains have been colonized with that what's in it for Absolutely, me mindset. Absolutely, yes. yes. How long can your community last? Not, Not very long. long. No. No. No, look, um, e even in the work that we've done, uh, Philip, the, the work that has occurred where we have spoken to, uh, uh, you know, ranges of people and said, look, uh, we're looking at buying this first parcel of land, uh, and the number of times the question is, do I get my acre? And I've had to respond right. to people to say, no, this is not actually about you owning anything. This is about there being uh, land that we all have responsibility for. It is that it's that backflip into uh, essentially a traditional way, a, 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 a indigenous people's way that says you don't own the land, but quite the reverse. It owns you. Now you have responsibilities to it. You know, you it it will care for you, provided you care for it and one another. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, yeah, is, well, is, it, is, it, is it possible, do you think? Uh, do you think that uh, maybe the Western world has gone too far? Are we, are we redeemable? Do you think we can return to that? Or, or as uh, Rupert, uh, a friend of yours and mine, Rupert Faust has been saying, you know, there's a, what is it, S-H-T-F moment, you know, the shit hits the fan, and all of a sudden we find ourselves you know, defending a property that we've been living on because the, the hordes are coming from the city to eat and, and everything else. You know, uh, Peter, I think the, the, my, my answer to that question is I believe that we need to presence with what we're up against. We need to presence with that. We need, we need those of us that are on this path, we need to genuinely sit with the fact that we must also work up here in the mind yeah. like we have a lot to overcome in here to get out of the i to the we men, men mindset and 
where community can be done well in countries like Australia, it is going to require people to to get what we're talking about here and now and to be able to get out of the mindset of, can I sell at any moment for yep. fair value? Can I make a profit on this investment? Uh, will I hold share certificates in my name? You know, like all these questions that, and I'm a lawyer, so when I'm, it's so interesting when I deal with all of this in Australia, all of that is super important. Yes. It doesn't even get a run over here in Guatemala. It's not a consideration, you know? Um, so I think, I think the answer is yes. But we we need to recognize that it's hard work. And like to share with you a little bit about what I've experienced in our pro project in Mount Tambourine. We have had we have had uh, we had thirty investors come together, and we bought a large campground that we are developing as an off grid uh, village. I recall um, that. Yes. Yeah, and we we also we also had a large group of investors that kind of band together banded together about six of them. Uh, that 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 just weren't weren't okay with the way decision making was being done and wanted to start to assert more of their we want this done and we want it none done now and if it's not done now we're pulling out and all these all these threats threats of withdrawal and threats of legal action and things were thrown around and we kind of as a community and as the leadership group of that of that community which I am a part of that um, we sat in that fire. Peter. We sat in that mm. fire. We sat in the fire of being like, wow, th th that mindset could topple this thing right now. And that yes. will be sad. It didn't topple it, actually. I'm happy to tell you. But we had some people that that I what I witnessed was I saw 30 people, 30 families, 30 households attempt to start this thing. And I saw two thirds embrace the growth journey involved. And yep. surrendering a little bit to the unknown and being ready to go beyond the I and uh, I and me and mine and threats and la 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 and complaints. And I, and then I saw the one third that tried and and then just went the other way and went to how do I protect myself and how do I get my peace out of this and right. how do I stop my feet and, and demand, demand. And those people ended up making their way for the door to the door. And we found other other people to step in that were in, that wanted to step into this journey. I think what it takes, other than what we've already talked about, like the, the, the understanding what we're up against and finding people to come together that are ready to do that work. I think what it also takes is a, co a core group that can kind of withstand some of those difficulties, which I think yes. can are inevitable from time to time. And to be able to to be determined to 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 weather those storms, uh, knowing that um, as the, as this as whatever's been started, once a, a claim has been staked on a piece of land and a concept has been put together, and the the, the ship has been landed, so to speak, it's it, it's arrived, it's here, and 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 that that hard work has been done. That uh, if there are people that just can't can't stomach it anymore and need to go back to the I, me, mine matrix. Okay. Let them go with love. Thank you for trying. We honor that this is hard. And just knowing that being patient and not caving to threats and not freaking out about supposed legal actions and whatever, you'll find that people will be inspired by what you're doing and by the yep. storytelling you're engaging with to, to articulate what you're trying to do. And, and more, more people that are ready to get involved will, will, will appear. Um, that's been my experience anyway. Um, the interesting uh, so thing for so me, Philip, in, in looking at that mm -hmm. is that uh, that is the experience of essentially all relating. You know, it's like uh, uh, provided you're not uh, uh, provided you're not causing harm, like actually intending to cause harm, physical, mental, spiritual, whatever, uh, uh, that, that you remain in response rather than reaction, that you stay in the room with one another, that you recognise uh, challenge for one another. You know, I am you, kind of kind of vibe, rather than I am against you. Uh, mm. So it's a, but quite a thing to navigate, as you say, in a in a world where we're essentially taught you will need to uh, uh, start looking after yourself by the time you're eighteen. You'll need to have a bank balance. You'll need to start saving up for the day that you no longer have a job. That's uh, that that mm. whole thing is is based around this kind of fear complex that says you know things could easily go wrong uh, and rather than creating a support network of people that could hold 
the things that might go wrong. Uh, it's like, a, no, so isolate yourself. Isolate yourself and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and have power over rather than power with uh, those around you. Yeah, a frightening yeah. thing in our Western society. And I, uh, that leads me to something that uh, I'd like your opinion on in that I've come to a place where I think that Western society and Western civilization doesn't have much time to go. So there's uh, mm. there's more of a rush uh, to, uh, to for us to learn, I guess. So would you agree that uh, that Western civilization looks like it's uh, on a kind of downward spiral, or do you have more hope for it than that? I feel like one of the good things to come out of COVID was that it was it really kicked people into action, um, and I and I saw a whole group of people that were 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 ready to take this adventure that you described this journey to the village that that realized that specializing their skill set into this narrow little skill set that you get fiat currency in return for and then you dawdle off to the supermarket to get all your other basic needs met um and you rely on a, you know big brother or the big father figure government and co corporation to s sustain your means of living um, I, I think that, that a lot of people during COVID uh, started to realize that that is not a proposition that feels comfortable and that sits well for them. Right. I think a lot of complacent masses, however, have kind of just returned to business as usual, expecting business as usual will um, continue on unbroken. Uh, but I don't, I don't believe that that is uh, what we are headed into. I believe that we're living in the, in an era of the what they re, what's referred to as the fourth turning, um, and fourth turnings are a cyclical thing. They they've happened in the past, but our our generation is certainly heading towards that. There's any number a number of um, existential events that um, are are likely to confront us with a scenario far more alarming and far more disturbing to the comfortable lifestyle that we've all, all bought into and become used to living within um, that has us, as I say, specialized into this narrow skill set and relying yes. on the machine the system, everybody else to um, maintain our, our uh, means of living. Um, just to pick one example of that, um, it's very likely, I, it's sad to say this, but it's very likely that we're looking at a scenario in the Middle East where we'll see the use of nuclear weapons in the next couple of years. It does so seem if likely, we yes. saw it, very likely. And so let, this is just one scenario, but it's it's to me one of the more highly, highly likely scenarios. So in the event that Iran was to drop a nuclear weapon on Israel, the ramifications of that for all of our ways of living as we know it now. I mean, the first thing that would happen is the price of oil would go through the roof, like yep. historic, like historic, historic prices for oil. Now, what's that going to mean for this global supply chain that right. transports everything that we eat and drink all around the world? It's going to bring it to an immediate halt. The whole yes. logistic system, this this just in time delivery system of everything that we eat and and drink to live in these yeah, cities. Two days. Two days yeah. is all we have, essentially. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's how vulnerable we are. It's like one point of failure. What literally one point of failure. And I mean. The United States and Iran are at war with each other. I mean, Soleimani, who was the one of their great leader, essentially their great general, was assassinated during the Trump administration when he when he was in an airport in Iraq. Like that's extraordinary. Like to think that Iran is not at war with the United States and vice versa. Like it's absurd. Like what what is yes. occurring is, is a war between Iran and the United States, and so. Iran, like Israel, is the United States that Iran can attack, you know, and the, the, the Iran's perspective towards Israel is annihilation. Is the perspective? There's no, there's no, there's no backing down from that from that position. So, if we were to see that scenario, it would be incredibly unfortunate for so many, for so many, and it would be a crisis of massive proportion where we're experiencing the literally the failure of the entire system that we've become re 
reliant on to live. And yeah. it would be, again, another moment of presencing with that question, what would I do if the supermarkets were empty? Yeah. Which is, I think, a, no it's, it's, I have a good answer for that. There is no good answer for that. You're quite right. And uh, I guess the the only reasonable answer for that is uh, to move in the direction that you've managed to move already. Like 50% of your food provisioning uh, is is mm. locally grown. You have it locally. Mm. Um, uh, we're looking at more like maybe 0.01% in, uh, in an Australian environment, similar in a US environment, similar in most of the Western world. So mm. we are mm. looking at a an incredible collapse, and and as Rupert put it, uh, you know, a shit hits the fan situation. Understanding what that would mean as the cities emptied, for example, uh, because that's what would have to occur. You would starve in a city, so the cities would empty, and we would see such a furor across the entire Western world. Uh, I think uh, places like South America, uh, Africa. Uh, um, uh, 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 maybe some of the Eastern Bloc countries would actually fare a great deal better than uh, than uh, what we see as the industrialised Western world because we are so industrialised we've lost contact even with our food sources. Yes, yeah, I mean th that that's that's fundamental, and I, and I think like to link this back to what we were talking about before about what a task the Western mindset has to return mm. to the village, that we have this monumental task of decolonizing our minds um, from corrupted algorithms, from woke mindset, party politics, from, from meaningless trivia that concerns people's minds these days. When and I, and I think what I'm saying is because that is such hard work, I think there will also be a natural role for these kind of crises, crises, potentially multiple occurring in the next decade or so, yeah. that will be a series of hard knocks, the school of hard knocks, they call it, right, in Australia. That's an expression that's often used. We kind of need the school of hard knocks because we are running a system, we are running a technology, we are running a program that has enslaved us, has um, colonized our minds with unhelpful ideas and has made us so incredibly reliant and vulnerable um, to, to these kind of influences and to corrupted power structures that are obsessed with profit and control and th they are beating the drums of war because war is profitable and good for them and yep. they're heavily inv invested in the oil industry. So that example that I gave, it's like, the people behind all of this, they know how these scenarios play out and they're heavily invested in oil. So when the oil price goes up, their coffers are full. And yes. mind you, the, all of these people, these billionaire class that are kind of steering all of this, do you think they don't own enormous amounts of farmland themselves with underground bunkers and food foods? Like Bill Gates owns more farmland than anyone. Than you anyone know, so else, yes. Yeah, so so you just have to look at where, like, one of the most one of the things that they will stitch you up the most uh, when you cross borders in this world is seeds. Yeah. What a weird thing! What a weird thing! Why are seeds so illegal? How does that fit yeah. within the context of what we're talking yeah. about? It all starts to make sense, doesn't it? It all sort of starts to make sense that the fact that we have given up our food sovereignty is exactly how we are colonized by the system. And if we were to reclaim our food sovereignty and to do that together in relationships of reciprocity with the land and each other, i.e. the village, the village mindset, the village way of living, uh, we would be um, essentially uncorrupted. We would not be reliant on, yes. on that system. And so that system requires that at least the vast majority of people are, are not um, are not realizing that, are not acting on that, or are afraid to, are afraid of the penalties involved in doing so. Um, so I think I think these hard knocks that are to come will be devastating, and and very sad for us to witness. And a lot of people that we know and love will be majorly, majorly impacted. But. Hmm. The well prepared, the well prepared, like like the Jews in sixty six CE in Jerusalem that heeded the warning, and when the Roman when the Roman armies uh, encircled Jerusalem and then withdrew, they escaped the city, 
And when the Romans returned in 70 CE and flattened the city, they 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 were living a nomadic life. They had escaped they the city. There. They had escaped. They had escaped the peril. And so, did the majority escape Jerusalem? No, no. The majority fell by the sword and fell with the fall of the of the temple. But um, an awake few, an awake few that paid attention to the signs, took action. They and 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 the thing that's an interesting parallel there is those people in those ancient times, that allegorical, that historical story. What did they do? They voluntarily took on difficulty that they didn't need to. Yes, and they would have been laughed at by their relatives and friends that stayed in the markets, enjoying the the dates and the fruits and the wine of Jerusalem for three, four years between sixty six and 70, 70 CE. And those those people that escaped would have been in the nearby, doing it tough in the nearby wildlands of of that of that time, in the, essentially living in the desert, struggling to find enough water and supplies to keep their families fed. But they would have they their lives continued far longer than those that lived it up for those last three or four years in the city. And so yes. I think that historical time essentially we're in a moment we we are in a similar kind of moment now. It's it's kind of the prison of comfortability. Exactly. Yeah, the, the exactly. fact that we, we find ourselves in, uh, uh, well, with a range of things. Uh, so uh, the mortgage is, a, is, a, is one binding way that, you know, that we are bound to a system. Uh, uh, no, uh, of, uh, like food dependence, absolute food dependence on supplies that we must purchase um, is, is another way. Uh, uh, mm. uh, credit cards. Uh, uh, and and largely also just the general comfort with uh, uh, in which we can live life. You know, we live the lives of kings and queens mm. from only several hundred years ago, and we're doing it in our millions. Uh, also not sustainable mm. on the basis that uh, there are now reports that indicate that our topsoil is likely to be completely and utterly depleted within about 50 to 60 years. So for me, I'm, mm. I'm looking at that and thinking, well, there will still be patches of land, of course, but we're talking about the industrial agriculture complex has to collapse within that time based on all the predictions we currently have. It surely has got to be time for us to reconnect with one another, grow our own food, uh, and put up with one or two difficulties, maybe four or five or six, in order to also meet with the incredible companionship of community, mm -hmm. the 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 naturalness of being face to face with one another um, in in the Guatemalan environment and recognizing you have expats and and the local people. How does that work? Is that uh, is that a comfortable fit? What, what's a comfortable fit? Oh, like living living with the Guatemalans here? Yeah, with the Guatemalans, with um, Americans, with Australians, with uh, a, a range of different cultures that come together. And as you say, you're learning from them. Uh, is there conflict in that learning? Is there conflict in that uh, in that integration of, of various cultures? Uh, definitely, I think there's a lot of teething issues that we're working out here in in living here, and it, it takes it takes a mindset of one of the big things to presence with is how do we use our money well in this part of the world? Like how do us Westerners that come here with our dollars that stretch a lot further? How do we not just come here and dispossess the locals and just take right. over and start running businesses and, and line our pockets from making money from the tourism dollar and just attract other Westerners to experiencing a good lifestyle and become wealthy that way? Look, there's a little bit of that. I mean, it plays out a lot more noticeably in somewhere like Cancun in Mexico, let's say, these, these kind of like more developed places that are building nightclubs and, you know, just party environments, you know. But right. here where I'm living here in Sunana, uh, the reason why I picked being here is I saw that a lot of the Westerners in this village are really trying to go about things in a good way. They're trying to partner with locals. Um, one of the things I've really been inspired by is some friends of mine that have started ventures in the cacao business, where they really try to in hire local women. Like there's a big issue here with domestic violence and drug abuse and alcohol abuse within the, the local population. And so women are historic, like very oppressed in this part of the world compared to Australia. Like women right. really do very tough Guatemala. 
Um, but a lot of a lot of the enterprises, a lot of the NGOs, and also the businesses that have been started up here by Westerners have been by people who have been really touched by, let's say, the, the plant medicine path. They've been touched by the spirit of cacao, the heart opening spirit of cacao. And they've really wanted to do capitalism in a good way. And I've seen that with my own two eyes. I've seen them hire local women, pay them a good wage, give them good working conditions, pay them holiday time, you know, like really be there for them. And, and I think that's what's inspired me is that it's not necessarily the safest place to be, you know, like here in rural Guatemala, it can be a dangerous place. There are Westerners that will get robbed or things will happen occasionally. It's not necessarily as safe sure. as it might be in Australia, but it's it doesn't have the unsafety of the nanny state that kind of exists in Australia, which is kind of like an existential unsafety. Here, the, that unsafety is more line of sight. It's more the drunk man with the machete at 10 p.m. at night that might be frightening to you. You right, know, right, I mean, personally, yes. I've never been threatened in that kind of scenario, but that exists here. That exists yeah. here. Um, but what I have loved to see also is I'm very passionate with permaculture. It's why, you know, Rupert is a real uh, ally of mine. I first came to this. Um, I first came to this valley um, to study natural building and permaculture. There's quite a few um, expats that have bought land here and that are doing their permaculture projects in a really good way. It's very good soil here. I mean, Guatemala as a country is not at all immune to uh, the global agricultural situation. I mean, sure. a lot of the lands here are also badly depleted. They also have very like poor awareness around the use of pesticides in the country writ large, you know, around the big monstrosity of Guatemala City and, and the agriculture that exists around that metropolis would be no different, possibly worse than it is in Western countries. Um, yeah. But uh, but here in this Mayan village, they save seed. They the the land, uh, the soil is incredibly fertile. It's it's essentially forest floor. A lot of this valley is forest. Uh, there's two waterfalls here and two big rivers that run down the valley uh, to the lake. Um, but then at the same time, another topic to to mention is that lake, the, this beautiful Lake Atitlan here at the base of the three volcanoes that are here. It's a famous place. You probably Algis Huxley was here maybe like back in his time in the 30s, he said it was the most beautiful place he'd ever seen. There's a quote from Aldous Huxley about Lake Atitlan. And it is, it is a stunning place. It's also a place that is gradually becoming um, polluted. It's being polluted by large cities that are discharging effluent into the lake without pop proper water treatment. So there, it's also important not to just idealize the indigenous culture and right. be like, oh, they're doing everything perfect. Because where we're at now is that the merger of building cities and large populations living for, for now such a long period of time in modern ways um, on the lake, it's also contaminating that lake. And, you know, when I talk California, it's like a lot of a lot of great presidents designated all their great lakes to be uh, cultural monuments and preserved as national parks. And they're all pristine and clean. And over here, you have this gorgeous lake at the feet of the volcanoes with the Mayan culture all around it. And it's sadly slowly becoming toxified. Right. So there are great ecological and, and social, yeah, there's the social issues I touched on, the domestic violence and problems in the families and drug and alcohol abuse. Um, there's the, there's the, there's the, um, there's the skeletons and pain in the closet from, from you know three four hundred years of 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 colonialism and the conquer yeah. conquering of this land by the Spanish, um, so yeah, there's there's the consequences of that genocide and then there's the ecological um, strife that that is that is that is present um, here as well, and that's where I sort of feel that uh, there is immense also potential for Westerners with the right mindset to come to a place like this. Um, and try to try to achieve re regeneration, try to do capitalism in a good way, try to use their money to support locals to continue to plant their indigenous lands and produce good yielding food from it and to support their families in a good way and to avoid just having all the all the able-bodied men crossing the border into the United States to make $30 an hour work on construction sites over there, but yeah. actually encouraging them to recognize that the village that they live within is a special place and one worth supporting and uh, in doing that in a good way. So 
it's a fascinating yeah. place. There's a lot of facets to all of that. Um, yeah. Is your life a lonely life? I miss Australia sometimes. I miss my family. I was blessed to have my mum and dad visit recently, and it was so nice to show them what I'm doing here. Um, it's not a lonely life because I live in a close community here. There's about 10 to 12 of us that live here, and we work together and we collaborate and we spend a lot of time together. Um, I, I, I am also really passionate to continue to... Um, I have not given up on Australia. Like, I, wa I want to be... In Australia, I want to continue to contribute. This is why I do a lot of the online online work that I do and seminars. And um, I'm trying, I guess what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to continue to study uh, the village here as I experience it and try to articulate the insights, try to write about it, try to create content about it, try to continue to send messaging back home, try to um, use my skill set as best I can to to stay connected to my roots and my community in Australia. But it is a good question. I mean, I do I do pine for my homeland and my home people, my my dear friends and family that I that I that I do miss a lot. Um, but at the same time, I I feel there's 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 a lot of value in what I'm doing here, and I feel like I'm learning and growing a lot. So it continues to hold my um, hold my interest and my physical presence for the time being. And um, and you I'm have time to write. Invest... I try to make time to write. Yeah, I have a <laughs> I have a book coming soon that's going to be kind of elaborating on these themes. Um, and the approach that the book takes is it has a bit of like some essay form to sort of express some of this more brainy stuff about all of these topics. But then it's a, also a collection of poetry because my idea as well is to try to reach the hearts of those that right. are out there contemplating these subjects as well. And I feel that the form of poetry, uh, uh, the poetry that I'm sharing is a collection of poetry I've written over the last three years as I've traveled and explored all of this and, and then put my roots down in my community here and also in Australia. So it's an attempt to kind of weave these narratives together in a way that um, can reach people's hearts. Yeah, it's uh, uh, by the sound of it, uh, the combination of both uh, the practical and the artistic or the creative. So, and and they must operate side by side. You know, you you do need to dig the ground. You do need to build the structures and the dwellings, but you also do need to sing together, laugh together, play together, uh, create together. Uh, um, it's they they cannot be separated. They must be there together. And let's look more closely at that when you're about to publish the book and do this again and have a talk about uh, about where that's going precisely. I'd love to. I'd love to. This has been a great chat. And um, yeah, I really resonate with what you're saying there. Like, I feel like my path over the last, you know, like nothing could be more left brain than being a lawyer, you know, like it's very matrixy in a lot of ways. Yeah. And then, much. and then my path over the last three, four years has been very much the path of the artist. You know, I've been exploring art form, singing, devotional music, kirtan, also poetry and writing in a more creative, expansive way. And, and so I have my stuff that I do, which is like seminars and online content and stuff to do with where I'm wearing my lawyer cap. And that's mostly focused on my clients back home in Australia, but I'm also, I'm also trying to share the narrative, share the story, share this intercultural weaving that's going on um, between myself and the local people here, but also, um, yeah, expre ex express some of that in an, in an artistic form, because as you say, um, it's both, it's both, yeah. it's both an art and a science, you could say, an art and a science to do this magic. Because what we're pointing to here is that there's a real fundamental change that we we know needs to take place. And as we've kind of sketched out in this conversation, it's not an easy one. It's not an easy one. We have we we have a sense of what we're up against and it, it's real and it's not easy. Um, right. And so the art form combined combined with the science form needs to weave the star of David, the up the upright triangle and the downside triangle in perfect unison, you know, that re right and left hemisphere of the brain or the brain and the heart working together in tandem or the masculine and the feminine working together in tandem is yeah. what it's going to need. It's going to, it's going to need to be the full human, the, 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 the whole, the whole human soul embodied spirit 
um, as men and women working together to 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 birth something new into the world um, and to to weave that, whilst we whilst we experience the crumbling of what of what has been. Yeah, and I think that that's the uh, the important thing for me is that uh, if we if we look historically, uh, we can see that there have been times of massive change, and it's it's sometimes quite difficult to grasp that we are currently in one. That is. Uh, people quite frequently will say to me, uh, you know, do you think there's going to be some kind of cataclysmic event? And I respond by saying, well, a cataclysmic event on a world scale, on a on a all of Earth, on all of the living things scale, could be over 100 years. If we're talking about on a human scale, it may not feel cataclysmic. But over a 100-year period, yes, we are in a cataclysmic event now. And massive change is upon us. Uh, so uh, both you and I uh, are at least making our best effort to meet that with something other than uh, quietly dying in a cocoon of comfort. Yeah, I mean, Thoreau said um, most men live a life of quiet desperation and you kind of to break out of that 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 atrophy, that that uh, that um, inertia of the yes. status quo and that quiet operation uh, it takes some 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 real like inquiry as to what is it that feels somewhat out of out of doesn't feel right about what's going on in the world and what's going on around me and you know that masculine that masculine pull to provide for one's family i think there was a time maybe in the post-world era, let's say, like from, you know, when my father was like working hard as a family man and working in the corporate world and providing, you know, through through the 70s and 80s and 90s and into the 2000s, sure, you you could have that uh, that mindset that, yes, if I just work for a good company and make this yep. money and put it in a bank account, I can spend it at the supermarket and I can feed my family. But if you're a young man now with a small family, confronted with and if you're if you're switched on you really open your eyes and really look at the world and you're properly informed um let's have that as a caveat but can you really properly properly say you know hand on heart look yourself in the mirror and say yes by specializing in this narrow thing that i do for this company where they pay me this artificial fiat currency that's in the bank i am i am providing for my family now and on into the future and i'm confident in that well for me, no. the answer is no, because I had all those conditions. I had the matrix job. I had the, I had the, I had the salary. Me too. Um, I had the, the, yeah, I had the corporate law gig, you know, and I was good, doing good at that. But I didn't believe in it. Over the long yeah. term, I didn't believe in it. So I knew I needed to reorient myself um, to a situation where I'm mostly focusing on building community, building living structures, and growing food because I feel that those essential human needs. Um, having a specialized, a highly specialized job in which you get money, those things are proxies for providing building structures and food to the people you love. Yes. And so that same masculine impulse to provide, which is a beautiful impulse, it's beautiful and sacred. It's the sacred masculine and the world needs it, but it needs to, it, it, it's in a time of needing to reorient because it's going to start to go, hold on a second. I'm not sure that working for this AI company that's chewing through this much electricity to provide sneakers for some meta meta avatar for 18-year-old kids in South Korea, I don't think that that level of meta being that deep in the metaverse, that, de that deep in the artificial verse makes sense when actually what is my goal? My goal is to put food on the table for my wife and small children. Yeah. But I'm, I'm way over here, some disembodied virtual reality. There's a disconnect there. There's well, a palpable it, disconnect. Yes, look, and it, yeah. it, it actually lands in this country in in uh, I think I think a fairly simple and recognisable way that that uh, you know the average income is somewhere around between fifty and eighty thousand dollars. The average home is somewhere mm -hmm. between four hundred and a million dollars as an average. So you're looking at people having to yeah. spend, you know, like a, to to part with essentially or borrow. 10 times the, the amount they earn in a year in order to have a structure in which they can live. That's just mm. insane. You know, that's a, that is a, a really clearly defined 
way of determining that we are way off track because if we don't have food in our bellies, if we don't have uh, water and we don't have a structure over our heads and some people to, to care for us around us, we genuinely are lost. Um, and that's, that seems to me where Western society has gone completely and utterly insane. Yeah, and I, and I think like the 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 great like to just to circle back to your point about the topsoil, Peter. You know, hmm. permaculture started in Australia. Bill Mollison, Bill. Uh, you, know, did, did, you might have you might even know Bill yourself personally. I met Bill. Now, yeah, Bill. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, Bill started the permaculture movement right just down the road from where you are right now. And yes, uh, permaculture is the answer. Permaculture is the answer to the depleted topsoil. If the greatest revolutionary that act that one can do right now, other than save seed, is drum roll, do your own compost. Yeah. Compost. Compost. Create nutrient, create micronutrients. Um, you know, bur burn some wood in your fire, use the carbon from that, um, get 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 a good, rich, dark compost going on wherever you live, spread that around the land and learn to grow from seed and learn get strains of seed that you can harvest seed and just realize the frequency of abundance that is nature, that one yes. plant will give you hundreds of seeds. Yes. And, and and like this is this is this is this is the great revolutionary act and it's like it's incredible that in 2024 that is the that is the statement that is the statement yes. of revolution save seed make compost re-nutrient re-nutrient re what's the word for that restore the nutrient content of of the soil on the lands in in, in which you live so that you might go to sleep knowing that you are investing in something that you can, you can believe hand on heart is going to have the capacity to feed your family on into the future. Um, yeah. And I, and I, and I, I think we will see a great turning. I mean, I've had visions of this. I want to create some kind of art form soon of like, you know, the biblical, the biblical um, image of beating swords into plowshares. plowshares. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I personally love the Bible. I love the Bible. It's full of incredible imagery. The swords into plowshares is great. For me, I love swords into plowshares. Going from warfare into working the soil, amazing. That that that's yeah. the new earth in a nutshell. But the imagery that I see is the corporate, the corporate necktie suit Sword. laden box person, boxed up man in this suit stripping away the suit for the cowboy hat and the shovel and going going out and striking that shovel into the soil and saying i i, I this is this is my revolution this is my yeah. act of service to my family it's that i i no longer sit i no longer sit in a disembodied glass ivory tower staring at my email inbox and instead i go and i actually make sure that i can feed my family so I'm, I, I still I, I still need to make something of that. It might be a painting or it might be a song. I'm not sure, but it's definitely I, maybe I can use an AI tool to create that image. But it's uh, it's it's the thing that I'm <laughs> I, I'm having dreams of at the moment. I have I have a similar idea, uh, although mine is uh, mine is an art form that is going to be on the ground. You've already done this in that you've put mm. together a community. Uh, uh, I'm just about to launch into a fundraise with literally thousands of people to get the first piece of land over which we will hold responsibility. Uh, so none of us will own it and all of us will participate in it. Uh, to be the, the first one of those will be an art piece in itself to expand that out so that we essentially move into a place where there's a place to dig that sword that's turned now into a shovel into the ground without saying, this is mine, but rather saying, this is for all of us, including the earth that we stand on. Absolutely. I love to hear that. I look forward to meeting in person with you and your group. I'm I'm coming to Australia in August so we can meet Good. in person and chew about that. Um, please share with me that stuff. I'll share it with my networks as well and help get the word out because, um, yeah, I, I love that. I look forward to seeing that become a reality. Thank you. Fabulous. And um, just la a final question. Do we have hope for the future? 
We do. We do. I mean, I, I see satellite communities getting started within an hour to two from major cities all around the world. I'm very active on the Foundation of Intentional Communities page on that forum where I see so many people saying they're they're buying land here. They're a bunch of friends in California recently that I was hanging out with. They've they're all van lifers. They bought some land in Reading and they're all parking up in their vans and starting to figure out all right, how do we move water properly around the land? How do we start to grow some food? You know, so yes, I believe there is hope. There is always hope. We can never give up on hope. And at the same time, I think it requires a, you know, Socrates said, you know, the unexamined life is a life not worth living. And I think it requires a sober analysis. Um, it requires to dispel some of the idealism. I think a lot of the people I've seen can be a bit idealistic about this stuff yes. and then they, they don't really get very far. I think we need to really presence with what we're up against in terms of decolonizing our minds from the I to the we mentality and how we can be in right relation with this spirit called money, how, how we can not objectify money and how we can use it as a spirit to make life more beautiful um, for ourselves and those that we love. And, and if those messages reach men's hearts and women's hearts out there, and I already see it taking place, um, there's always hope. So that would be my take on that. Thank you, Philip Tripp, uh, um, a co, let me see, co-ecologist, co-villager, co-intentional uh, community builder, uh, and uh, inspirational man who is working in this field on the ground from Guatemala. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on The Village Voice and let's talk again soon. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, yeah, it's great to talk with a fellow revolutionary. Um, we could do another one of these sometimes where I could one, one day where we could put my legal hat on and we could talk about Australia, Australia's history, Australia's colonial history, about the the sovereignty movement in Australia and the possibility for a political revolution led by the indigenous people. And there's, there's lots of very yeah. interesting topics that we could explore. Um, but this has been an honor. This has been a privilege. It's been so, so great to speak with such an impressive mind um, with so much experience as yourself. Um, and yeah, I've been very inspired by the village. I, I loved it when I was there. Um, I look forward to coming to one when I'm back in Australia later this year. And um yeah, Godspeed, and I'm so excited for your project. I uh, can't wait to find out more about it. So I'll make I'll make sure that, that. You, make sure that you're included. Yeah, and yes, we will have those conversations. Philip Tripp, thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Peter. God bless.